Lord, we pray for the leaders in our world. May they make decisions that will maintain freedoms that will further your gospel. Lord, we pray for Doug as he preaches today. May your words be his and guide and direct him and continue to bless in the ministry, Lord. Lord, I'd like to end this prayer by repeating your words in Isaiah 41.10. Lord, you say, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Lord, we just cling to those words, not because of our deeds, but because of your son's blood. We hold on to them. Lord, give us the grip of Jacob. Lord, he held on despite having a dislocated hip. And he had Esau approaching to destroy him and his family. Lord, we know there's a time of trouble coming. But sometimes, Lord, the hardest time is when we're in prosperity. Lord, help us to hold strong to you. Because, Father, you are our only hope. And, Lord, at this time, let us close the prayer and sing together as a congregation. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart. Amen. Well, today we had Layla and KK Kazia that gave their lives to Jesus. And as church family, I am so happy for them. We have a few gifts for you. These are just some things for you to have, for you to read. I also have your baptismal certificate to remind you what happened this day. And to just the church family, I would ask those who are church family here at Granite Bay, how many of you accept these two as members of our family here at Granite Bay that um, want to, with their parents, help out in the, in the process of guiding and comforting and just befriending them? How many here today make that, that plea? Amen. All right. Well, you two can go. Friends, thank you for not... not they are my friends as well. I was talking to you, looking at them. You guys can go. Thank you. Friends, in October, we're going to be restarting our baptismal class, our kids' baptismal class. So if you have children that want to go through the process of learning and understanding more about the Bible and about God, know that in October we will be beginning. Um, stay tuned to the, uh, the bulletin that will have that announcement. And now on Friday, we have our Get Back to School Vespers. All the information is in the bulletin as well. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lucas. A lot happening at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. Can you say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. I just, I feel God's presence here right now, and I just, it's a joy to come together with his people. I want to welcome those who are here, as well as we know we have many friends who are watching on television or on social media, and we have some who are online members that have no local church, and uh, this is their home church, and we welcome you. Uh, if you have been coming, you know that we've been doing a series called Cover to Cover, Jesus in All of the Bible. And two weeks ago, last week, we were gone to the ASI convention. That was wonderful, by the way. And, uh, but two weeks ago, we did begin the book of Esther. And there was so much there, we just knew we couldn't get through it all. So this would be, it's actually part 17 in the series. It's the second part on the story of Esther, looking for the story of the gospel in the book of Esther. Now, I don't know if you've uh, ever enjoyed looking at a royal wedding. How many of you uh, saw in 2011 when Kate Middleton and Prince William got married? Did anyone watch that? You were not alone. 162 million people watched. I missed it. 
Prince Charles and Diana had 750 million people watch the wedding. But in 2018, when Meghan Markle and Prince Harry got married, they received 1.9 billion viewers, if you can imagine that. People like watching the weddings because they all want to see what the groom is going to look like. <laughs> Why do you laugh? I think it's because we all know who is it that we want to see at the wedding. We want to see the bride. Do we have, yeah, you've got the picture there of those three brides. You know, the book of Esther is one of those rags to riches stories of uh, an orphan becoming a queen. And it talks about feasts. But it's interesting that it begins with this great feast. Now, I'm going to do some review for those who may have missed it because this is very important. The book of Esther tells us a lot about Jesus, the gospel, even you can find a lot of echoes from Daniel and Revelation in the book of Esther. In the third year of the reign of Ahasuerus, better known as Xerxes I, Xerxes the Great, he has a feast that lasts 180 days. That would be three and a half Jewish years. That's a very important point. That's how long Jesus taught. At the end of that time period, he has this prophetic party, you can say, and what does it say? It says, when his heart was merry. Now, I knew that I'd get some comments after the message a couple of weeks ago because um, I said, look, we're looking at this story as an allegory. And I said, the king commands the queen to come so they can see her beauty. I mean, what would you think if you went to a wedding, the bride said, I don't want anyone to see me. But she does not come. And I said, that was not good in the days back then. We're talking about the days. Now, I got a lot of letters already. And people said, oh, if I was Vashti, I wouldn't want to go all these guys drinking and then say, come gawk at your beauty. And I understand. You probably would like Vashti as your neighbor, and that would be fine. And if you look at this story through the eyes of the suffrage movement or the temperance movement, Vashti did the right thing. But if you look at it as a Bible allegory that here Xerxes, the king of kings, has a feast after three and a half years, and he wants everyone to behold his wife who is chosen for her beauty. And she says, no. You know what that reminds me of? Jesus, look in Matthew 21, 22, 23. Look, for instance, Matthew 22, verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and he sends out his servants and calls those who are invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. What is that parable telling us about? His own people said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll be there. We want to be your people. But when the time came, what did his own people do to him three and a half years after ministry? And did Jesus have a feast with wine before he went to the cross? The king of kings, his own people said no. Matthew 21, 43, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to another. Was the throne of Vashti taken from her and given to another? What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. Matthew 23, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, beginning in verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. Not willing what? Jesus has come unto me. They don't come. You know what it says in Acts chapter 1? Speaking of Judas, because he never did fully surrender to Jesus, his place will be taken away and given to another. And this is how the book of Esther begins. Someone you would never guess, an orphan girl, is brought to the palace, and the queen is dethroned. Now, everyone understand, we're looking at this as an allegory. So that happened in our last study. It's interesting, it happens after three and a half years. And then they begin this royal beauty pageant, and the most beautiful girls in the kingdom out of 127 provinces are chosen. After they're chosen, they can't just go into the king. They go through a one-year 
purification, that's a word for sanctification process, with oil, among other things, which is a symbol for the Holy Spirit, before they're fit to go into the presence of the king. In the story of Esther, you find if you just march into the presence of the king unprepared, you will die. Or unless he extends the golden scepter to you, you and I could not endure the presence of God right now. Amen? If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus. So she goes through all of this purification and cleansing. Don't miss Esther chapter 2, verse 17. It says, the king loved Esther more than all of the other women, and she obtained grace. Who does Esther represent, you think? This beautiful woman, what is a woman? That obtains grace, and she is from the Jewish line? She, he loves her, and she obtains grace more than any of the other virgins. And he set the royal crown upon her head. Will we wear crowns in the kingdom? When does this happen? In the seventh year of his reign, exactly three and a half years after the first episode. Now, doesn't the book of Daniel have a prophecy where the ministry of Christ to his people is divided in seven years? Three and a half, in the midst of the week, Christ is cut off. Then another three and a half, Stephen is stoned. And then there's a great persecution. At the end of this seven years, there is a great persecution to annihilate God's people. Stay with me. I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans 9, 25. Paul says, as he says in the book of Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who is not beloved. By the way, it's after the stoning of Stephen, seven years after Christ begins his ministry, Paul is converted, and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. The Jewish nation had plugged their ears. And Jesus said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the children of the king, the natural children, they will be cast out into outer darkness. If we don't come to Jesus, if we don't appreciate the presence of the king, some people can't make it to church once a week, and they think they're going to make it to heaven. If we don't appreciate the presence of the king, then we might find another takes our place. So, of course, we know that uh, Esther is the younger cousin of Mordecai. We often think of him as Uncle Mordecai. But um, he, uh, he has a job as a clerk or a scribe. He sits in the king's gate. And when you get to the end of chapter uh, 3, or chapter 2, it tells us that after the end of this three and a half year period, the second three and a half year period, Esther's in the palace, there is an effort to assassinate the king. There are those who want the king dead from his own people, either through intercepting some correspondence or overhearing a conversation. Mordecai becomes aware of that. He tells Esther, who tells the king, there's an investigation, and these are, gentlemen are hung. They are found to be guilty. So it's interesting that there's an effort to kill the king. Was there an effort to kill Jesus? And he is killed, but he rises again. So now you get to chapter 3, and it introduces the, uh, the, the arch villain in the book of Esther. Horrible Haman. That doesn't call him that. I call him that. The word Haman means magnificent. Uh, he represents the devil. I'm not going to keep you in suspense. It says in Esther chapter 3, verse 1, After these things, Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were before him. What did Isaiah want? Uh, sorry, what did the devil want? It says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, it says he wanted his throne set above all the stars. He wants the highest place. By the way, uh, don't miss the connection that Haman is an Agagite. He's not a Persian. The king of the Amalekites, the ancient enemy of Israel, his name was Agag. King Saul, who was from the tribe of Kish, was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites, but he didn't obey the Lord, as he was told, and he ended up losing the kingdom because of that. And look what happens. If you don't do what God says, the descendants of Agag, some of them evidently survived. They make their way to Persia, and Haman now wants to exterminate God's people. And Mordecai is from Kish. 
So here you've got the ancient battle between Saul and Agag being acted out again between Mordecai and Haman. And through the Bible, you see the battle between Christ and Satan keeps reappearing over and over again. Well, when Haman is promoted, the king tells everybody they're supposed to bow to him. But Mordecai will not bow. And two or three times he goes through the gates and all of Mordecai's friends say, you're supposed to bow. He doesn't bow. Word gets to Haman and he looks and notices that Mordecai is not bowing and he is so filled with wrath. What did the devil say to Jesus? If you will fall down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. Mordecai will not fall down and worship him. So he says, well, I'm not going to just destroy you. I'm going to destroy all of your people. You read in Revelation that when the man-child is caught up to God's throne, the dragon tries to destroy the woman. When the devil can't reach Jesus, he tries to destroy his people. This is what's happening here in the story of Esther. So, verse, three, uh, verse 6 of Esther chapter 3. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, by the way, that's, Nisan is when you find Passover. In the twelfth year of Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that's like uh, dice. Don't miss the word pur, because later you're going to hear about a Jewish feast called Purim that is developed through this whole story. And they cast lots before Haman. They're, he's using witchcraft and sorcery to find out what would be the best time to annihilate these people, to attack the Jews, until it fell in the 12th month. You notice the word 12, 12. The numbers you find in Esther reappearing in a higher proportion than any other book in the Bible are the same numbers you find in Daniel and Revelation. One, by the word, first is found in Revelation, I think, eight times. Uh, Twelve, seven, three and a half. Uh, this book is a true story, but it is a prophetic book in some ways. So he not just wants to destroy Mordecai, he wants to destroy his people like the devil. And so he gets together and begins to schmooze with the king, and he says, there's a people in your kingdom. And, you know, he's got 127 provinces. He doesn't even ask which one. He says, and, and they're not obeying your laws. They're disregarding your commands. And he said, I think it's terrible. It's creating disunity. And your majesty, I feel so strongly about unity in the kingdom that I will even pay 10,000 talents of silver to the expense of annihilating these people. And he probably catches the king at one of their wine parties. And King Xerxes says, sounds good. Matter of fact, I'll pay for it myself. Now, that number, 10,000 talents, appears one other time in the Bible. It's used by Jesus in Matthew 18, where it talks about this man is found who owes the king 10,000 talents. It represents our sin. And here the devil is willing to give that amount to destroy us. What is it that's going to destroy us? If we're not forgiven, it's that 10,000 talents. In the parable in Matthew 18, the king forgives the amount. We want him to forgive our debt, amen? And the king says, it should be out of my expense because ultimately it's God who pays for our sins. So the king gives his signet ring to Haman. Haman gets all the scribes. They write up a law and it is a death decree. Now is this sounding like Revelation and Daniel? There's a death decree. And you look in verse 13 and letters, this is Esther 3, and letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate. This is genocide. All the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to plunder their possessions. So it's hitting them economically and it's hitting their lives, kind of like the plagues that came on Job. By the way, in Revelation, it says they cannot buy or sell. That's economic, isn't it? And those who do not worship the beast should be killed. That's their lives. So it's the same effect. I want to read something to you from the book Prophets and Kings, page 605. That's a classic. By the way, this is the last book that was written by E.G. White, 1915. 
The trying experiences that came to God's people in the days of Esther were not peculiar to that age alone. The revelator looking down the ages to the close of time has declared, the dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. Some who today are living on the earth will see these words fulfilled. By the way, it's interesting that not long after she said that, World War II broke out. And was there an effort to annihilate the Jewish people again? Probably one of the worst in history. And that's going to repeat itself again against God's spiritual Israel. The same spirit that in ages past led men to persecute the true church will in the future lead them to pursue a similar course towards those who maintain loyalty to God. Even now, preparations are being made for this last great conflict. Friends, what you're seeing here in the book of Esther is going to happen in the near future. If we worship God the way we're supposed to worship God, we're going to be persecuted for it. And uh, it's amazing how quickly you can lose your freedoms. So, the decree begins to go everywhere. It's like King Darius made a decree. Nobody's supposed to pray to anyone but him for 30 days. And it's circulated throughout his kingdom. So they got these couriers that take this death decree all throughout the Persian Empire. And Mordecai learns about it before even Esther does. And everyone is bewildered and perplexed. Where did this come from? And there's great consternation and mourning among God's people. And it says that uh, Mordecai, he comes to the king's gate and he's in mourning in chapter 4. He's in rags. He's got dust. And messengers tell Esther, your cousin, he's in mourning. And she finds out why and he sends a message. He says, haven't you seen the law? We are to be annihilated as a people. And it was your husband that did it. <laughs> Actually, they knew it was Haman behind it all. So Mordecai can't come into the king's presence because he's got rags, it says here. By the way, we cannot come without the right apparel into the king's presence. Adam and Eve had to be covered. So let's go to Esther chapter 4. And this is the great statement. We read this in our scripture reading the last two weeks. Esther 4 verse 11. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman, Mordecai, he basically says to Esther, you've got to go in and appeal for your people. You're the only one that will get the ear of the king that can do something about this. And by the way, what does it say in Daniel chapter 6 about a law of the Medes and the Persians? Do you know in American law, they still use that same term. They say according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, and that is a... Uh, that's sort of slang for it cannot change. The law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not change. Even unbelievers use that phrase. The king has made a law that cannot change. They're all to be annihilated. And Mordecai says, Esther, you need to appeal to the king. And she says, all the king's servants and the people of the king provinces know that if any man or woman goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called he has but one law, to put all to death. I mean, there's already been assassination attempts. If you come in invited, you're suspect. Except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter. Only the king has the right to intercede that law by holding out the golden scepter. That he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Now, we told you in our last study, Esther was the queen. But the king of Persia also had a harem. And uh, she had not been called in to the king for 30 days. Now, don't miss that time period. That time period appears in Revelation. It appears in Daniel as well. And Mordecai sends, and he sends a message. This is now verse 13 and 14 of Esther chapter 4. Think not within thyself that you will escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you altogether hold your peace at this time... Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Did Mordecai believe that God would rise up and save his people? Why did he believe that? The Messiah had not come yet. They had not fulfilled their purpose. God had a special work for them. 
He'll save us somehow. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. And who knows but whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He's saying basically, can't you see in providence, it's, don't forget, if you didn't uh, hear this because you weren't here the first time, the word prayer and the word God and the word Lord does not appear in the book of Esther. It is very unique in that way. But you can see the hand of God in a very powerful way all through the book. He's saying, bad karma is going to happen to you if you keep quiet. And he doesn't use that word, but you know what I mean. It's going to catch up with you. He says, and God will deliver us somehow. But providentially, you've gone from orphan girl to queen. What do you think, Esther? Maybe it's for this time. You know, whenever God puts us in a position of influence, it is always for his kingdom. He wants us to be a good influence. So, he says, you've got to go in for such a time as this. He says, your job is to not keep quiet. What does Mordecai? By the way, Mordecai is a type of Christ. He's the intermediary in this story. He's the one that will not bow down to Haman. And uh, he's telling Esther, the people are going to be saved because you open your mouth. Who does Jesus use to reach the world? The church, the bride of Christ. We've got to open our mouths. So do not hold your peace at such a time as this. Amen? Friends, we can't be quiet about what we believe. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. The laborers are afraid to speak up. We need to be interceding with the king for the people. So Esther said, go gather, this is verse 16, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan. She doesn't have the ability to send couriers through the whole kingdom, but they could at least tell them locally. They did have the internet in the city. And fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days. This is the most severe fast in the Bible. They're not just not eating. They're not drinking. Try that. The longest fast in the Bible is Esther and Paul. When Paul sees Jesus, he does not eat or drink for three days. Now, Moses did not eat or drink up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, but I think God supernaturally sustained him. Jesus fasted for food from 40 days, but he probably drank water. But she says, do not eat or drink. Go two days without water. That is a serious fast. And somehow she's still got to look pretty after this. So she's got a tall order. She says, I will go into the king uninvited, which means I could be killed. But then she says, what? If I perish, I perish. She has reached the point of taking up her cross and even dying, if that's what it takes to save God's people. Can you say amen? We need to all come to that point where we say, look, I'm going to, I am going to do what I'm supposed to do, and if I perish, I perish. I'm not going to live for myself. I'm going to live for my people. Now, notice what it says here. 30 days she's not come in before the king. She says, now I want you to fast, and I'm sure fast and pray, for three days. And then in the middle of the day, I'm going to invite the king to a feast. 30 plus 3 plus half is how much? You still with me? That's 33 and a half. How long did Jesus live? And then she goes into the presence of the king. Where did Christ go after 33 and a half? He said, behold, I ascend to my father, he told Mary. It's an amazing book. So our work is the work of Esther. So she goes into the king. She... Uh, Maybe she takes a drink of water after that three days and freshens up. And it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and she stood in the inner court of the king's palace. So it was when the queen, king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, and the king sees who's in the court, that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. You know, it's one thing for God to offer you grace, but you must accept the grace. I heard about this criminal that was condemned to hang, and the governor offered him a pardon, but he was so stubborn and proud, he said, I don't want his pardon. I said, okay, then you hang. So God offers you grace, but you must embrace that grace. She goes and reaches out, and she touches the golden scepter. I hope you've touched it, friends. It's interesting that 
Vashti would not come to the king when he commanded her, when he called her. Esther comes before she's called. What a difference. And then Vashti, the king says, what's your request up to half my kingdom? By the way, King Herod quotes that before John the Baptist loses his head. Three times the king of Persia, Xerxes, he said to Esther, what do you want up to half my kingdom? Three times he says that. He says, ask, ask, ask. What does God say to the church? She said, up till now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask. God is more willing to answer your prayers than you are to ask. We don't ask enough. We need to pray bigger prayers. He said, ask, up to half my kingdom. So she says, she's very cautious in how she does this. She says, first of all, this, today I'd like to have you and Haman come to a feast I prepared, and I'll tell you what my request is. So the king comes, and they have the little tea party and, and the feast, and then the king says, so what's your request? She says, my request is that you will come to the special dinner I have for you and bring Haman tomorrow. This was just an interlude. I have something I'll make. He said, Fine. I mean, this is a king who has a feast that lasts 180 days, so waiting an extra day doesn't matter to him. He says, fine. By the way, Xerxes at this point was pretty well done with his military campaigns in his reign. So he comes, he says, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow for the feast. Now go to Esther chapter 6, verse 1. Now the king experiences this very strange imperial insomnia. Why? You've got the whole Jewish nation praying for deliverance, and an angel is keeping him up. He can't sleep, and he's tossing and turning. He calls for the royal musicians, and they, they're not playing anything that helps, and finally he says, well, you know what usually puts me to sleep is when I get the scribe to read the chronicles to me. Have you ever, you know, like had somebody read the minutes of a meeting? And... Um, he says, bring in that guy, Herman. Have him ring, read the, the chronicles to me. Just, just, maybe I've missed something. I want to catch up on you know, the details, what's been going on. And he's reading, and pretty soon the king's getting drowsy, and all of he says, and there was an attempt to assassinate King Ahasuerus, and it was found out that Big Thai and Jareth, and the king goes, what? Oh, yeah. They were going to kill me. And he sits up in his bed. He said, wait, 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 stop. Back up. Who revealed this plot? Um, Mordecai. Mordecai. That's, he's in the gate, I think. Yeah. What did I give him as a reward? Mm, no reward. And the king says, ooh, that's not very kingly. So here this guy saves my life, and I don't even thank him. That's pretty bad. And so he's thinking, I've got to think of something good to do for this guy. And now, by this point, morning has come, and the royal dogs are barking, and the king says, who's in the courtyard? And the herald comes back and said, it's Haman. So, oh, Haman, my buddy, bring him in, bring him in. So Haman comes in. Now, you know why Haman's there? After he had left the feast the prior day, on his way back to tell the family, the queen is having a feast, and only me and the king are invited. And here I am his best friend. It's almost like being king, and, and Haman is so full of pride. And, but then he walks out the gate, and he sees that Mordecai will not bow. And he goes home, and he begins to stomp and to fume, and his family says, what's wrong? He said, I've got all this money, I've got all this power. He said, and I've got all these children, I've got all this success. He says, there's a special dinner at the palace and only the king and I are coming to the queen's dinner. He says, and all of this does me no good because of Mordecai the Jew won't bow to me. Well, you can tell he's got attitude problems, right? A little narcissism. He represents the devil. And his wife and his friends said, well, don't wait for the decree of the king. Get rid of Mordecai. What, build a gallows 50 feet high and hang him. He says, I'll do it. He says, I'll get the death decree from the king this very morning. So he gets carpenters, and they build this gallows. It doesn't take long, just a big tree. And, you know, I don't know what, 50 feet is a little overboard, even if, you know, Mordecai is 7 feet tall. You only need a 12-foot gallows. And they build one 50 feet wide wants to make a, an example of him. Christ said, if I be lifted up, 
I will draw all men unto me. So why is Haman there early in the morning? He wants to get the death decree signed by the king. When did they come to get a death decree from Pilate for Jesus? They woke Pilate up. And so the king says, Haman, come on in. And Haman's just getting ready to say, he thinks the king is going to say, what can I do for you? But instead, the king says, Haman, just before your request, I got something on my mind. What should be done for the one whom the king delights to honor? And Haman thinks within himself, who would the king want to honor more than me? So he's really asking, what would I like? Well, your majesty, here's what I do. Now, I'm giving you a pretty good translation here. It's not perfect, but this is what he said. This is what I would do. He said, uh, I would I'd dress him in the robes that the king wears and I'd put him on a royal horse that the king has ridden, and I'd give him a crown that the king wears, and I'd get the highest official in the kingdom to put all the royal apparel on him, parade him up and down the streets of Shusan, and say, thus shall it be done for the one who the king delights to honor, and have trumpets and fanfare. And the king said, all right. Well, that sounds good. He says, I want you to do that. And since you're the highest official I've got, you're the one who's going to execute all this, and you're to do it for Mordecai, the Jew that sits in the gate. <laughs> and when I get to heaven, there's a lot of videos I'm going to ask to pull from the archive that I want to see. And one of them, one of them is going to be the face of Joseph's brothers when he says, I am Joseph. One of them is going to be the face of Jacob when he wakes up in the morning and finds out, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> Another one is, I want to see the face of Heman when he hears the king say, Mordecai the Jew. And just as Haman is, drops his shoulders and he begins to tremble and he starts walking out, the king said, well, wait a second, what did you want? Oh, nothing, your majesty. So, you could probably also see the look on Mordecai's face when Haman comes up and says, follow me. And he has to dress him in the king's robes and put him in the king's crown and put him on the king's horse and march him up and down the street. And after he does this, he probably didn't do the whole parade route. He runs home with his head covered and he tells his family what's, with great consternation what's happened to him. And his family and his wise men said, you know, this isn't looking good, Haman. If you have begun to fall before Mordecai the Jew, you will probably surely fall. Because, you know, the Jews have a reputation for overcoming adversity when it looks hopeless. And it goes way back to what happened with King Saul and the Amalekites who were ultimately defeated. So, now, while he's trying to regain his composure, the messengers come from the palace and say, now don't forget the dinner today. You're coming to the feast. So he dries his eyes and powders his nose and tries to get his act together after this terrible humiliation. By the way, doesn't the Bible say, he who exalts himself will be humbled? And is it just me or the fact that Haman said, I want you to put on the king's robes on him, put the king's crown on him, put him on the king's horse? And what did Haman want? He wanted to be a king. What does the devil want? He wants to be the most high. Isn't that what he wants? He who highly exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And you find that Mordecai, who went to the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes, all of a sudden you see him going up and down the street in the royal robes. It's a law of life. So Haman has this incredible humiliation. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Jesus took a donkey into Jerusalem. Every knee will someday bow to him as everyone in the city was bowing to Mordecai. So they come to the dinner 
And they don't get very far. And the king says, Esther, I notice you're not eating. I can't wait any longer. What is your request? Haman's probably not eating much either. And Esther now makes this appeal for her life. The queen answered and said, if it please the king, let my life be given to me at my petition. What should be the greatest request of the church to Jesus? That we be saved. The penalty for sin is death. We're asking him to save our lives. Give me my life and the life of my people at my request. And that should be our prayer. To be saved, body, mind, and soul from hell. And she goes on and says in verse 4, If we had been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed and killed, for we have been sold, to be destroyed and killed and annihilated. Had we been just made slaves, I would have held my peace. She says, we would have been willing to serve but you're wanting to annihilate us. And this is going to be a terrible loss for the king. And she identifies with her people. My people. Now the king is going, what? Who would dare do such a thing? Who? And he jumps up from the table and knocks over the table cloth and, and says, who is daring to attack the queen? And this is that crucial moment. Wait for it. She said, the fiend, the wicked one, the evil one who is doing this is Haman. Now, if Haman had a bad day earlier, <laughs> it just got really bad. It's suddenly he's probably put two and two together to realize she's a Jew. You don't want to go against the Jewish people. <laughs> and you don't want to go against God's people. And the king, he is totally flummoxed. He is angry, says he's filled with wrath. He doesn't know what to do. He storms out of the banquet hall into an adjoining garden. And he's huffing around going, what, is this guy a traitor? What's going on? And maybe he's asking for details from his servants. That decree, the Jewish people, I heard they weren't obeying my commands. And his servants are saying, they were no problem. And he puts two and two together, and he comes back. And in the meantime, Haman realizes that evil is determined against him. And he figures that Esther is his only hope. And he starts to plead and beg desperately with Esther, and he trips or something. And she's on this reclining couch where, you know, they eat. And just as he's pleading that he'll, he said, I didn't mean it. I was just kidding. I didn't really want to kill all your people. Please forgive me. I don't know what he said. He trips. He falls on top of her, or he's pleading and he gets too carried away, begging and pleading, pulling at her ankle or something. And the king walks back in, and now he's really bothered. He said, is he going to force the queen in front of me? And as soon as he says that, his servants, realizing they, no one's supposed to look on the king's wife like this, they cover his face. And then one of the servants... Harbona, who actually used to work for Vashti. He says to the king, by the way, king, look from your balcony. You will see Haman's house, and they, you know, they all live in the royal quarter. And above his house, you'll see a gallows 50 feet high. He built that to hang Mordecai that had saved your life. And the king says, hang him on it. Mordecai is hung on the gallows. Sorry. Haman is hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. You know, the men who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace were killed by the fire. The men who connived to get Daniel thrown in the lion's den, Daniel came out alive. They were then eaten by the lions. Isn't that right? And it seems like uh, they say on the streets, what goes around comes around. Judas, who betrayed Jesus to be hung on a cross, hangs himself. If you turn from Christ, you end up hanging yourself. As, fall, as Saul, rather, fell on his own sword. So when the king, his wrath has subsided, he says to Esther, he says, everything that belonged to Haman, he was number two in the kingdom, I now give to you. And she gives it all to Mordecai. And you can read here, you look in Esther... Uh, 
Oh, let's see here. We'll go to Esther 8, 15. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel. He who was once in rags is now wearing royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And the Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor in every province and city where the king's command and decree came. By the way, Esther is now given the ability. She's given the king's signet ring. And he says, you and Mordecai get together and you make a new decree that will counteract the other decree and give you a chance to defend yourself. They couldn't rescind the old law, but they could get a law to preemptively attack their enemies before the other law. And so that's what they did. There's a new decree that's sent throughout the kingdom. And it says the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holy day or holiday. And many of the people of the land became Jews. Because of this story, what happens? People are converted. You know, the Bible tells us that when God's people go through persecution, it's when they're the best witness. When Daniel goes through the lion's den, King Darius makes the decree and the whole world hears about Jehovah. After Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fiery furnace, the king makes the decree, the whole world hears about Jehovah. And many turn. And you go to Esther 10. For Mordecai the Jew was next to the king Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all of his seed. It's interesting that here you have Joseph, who going through a great trial, ends up becoming the prime minister of Egypt. Daniel goes through this great trial. He becomes the prime minister of Babylon. Mordecai goes through this great trial. He becomes the prime minister of Persia. God has his representatives. They're all types of Christ. Mordecai was number two to the king. Jesus on the right hand of the Father in heaven. And you might be interested to know uh, the book of Esther is a true story. I've been telling you that. The names, the places, the times, the customs, it all matches up with Persian history. And history records tell us that Xerxes I had a very high official named Mardukia. Further, records even place Mardukia in Shushan where the events of Esther took place. It's very likely that uh, we're talking about the same person. What a wonderful story of how the intercession of this, this beautiful girl who was faithful in those things that were little. She always obeyed the commands of Mordecai. It says that because she was faithful in those things, God exalts her to a high position. She is faithful in much. She intercedes for God's people. She is willing to come to a place where she says, if I perish, I perish. Complete sacrifice that others might be saved. It's the story of salvation. And I hope that you see the picture of Jesus in this story. He wants us to come to that place of taking up our cross. You live for yourself, you will perish. If you take up your cross and you live for Christ, that's when you really begin to live. And we're going to stand and sing about that now. All to Jesus I surrender. I'd like to invite our singers to come out. And this is 309 in your hymnals. The words should also be in the screen. And I'd like to just also pray with you as we conclude that you'll make that decision to surrender all to Jesus.
the last verse in just a minute, but you know, sometimes I feel we've got a great opportunity to make a more specific appeal. And there may be some of you here today that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. You know that you need to make that decision to turn away from yourself, living for yourself, living for the world. Say you're willing to lose even the crown that you might gain the king. Lose that earthly kingdom that you might have that heavenly kingdom. And you've not made that decision. And you'd like to make that decision now. As we sing the last verse, we'd like to include you in a special prayer. And I just invite you to come to the front. Don't be afraid. We, we want you to come before the Lord, come before the King, and uh, we'll have prayer for you. As we sing verse 4, please come. some coming. Even before we pray, if there's anyone else, you feel that struggle in your heart, we're just going to have special prayer for you. You know that you need to make that decision to surrender all to Jesus. Come. Thank you. Praise God. Just anyone else. You know, you've been sort of on the edges of being a Christian, but you haven't really consecrated your life. The story in the Bible tells us there's two destinies. You're either, you're with the king or you're against him. You're either with Haman or Mordecai. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, oh Lord, our hearts are stirred and thrilled as we see the incredible power of your providence in this story. We know these things happen all through your word and in our lives every day that you're working to try to save us. Lord, we pray that you'll shake us and wake us up, whatever you need to do to help us realize that um, the, the earthly treasures do not satisfy that the only real peace and security is in surrendering our lives to you. I pray that as a church, that we will do the work of Esther, of speaking up, even at the peril of our own lives, sharing the good news about Jesus, not be intimidated by the devil in the world. Lord, we're living in the last days. We know it's not long before there'll be another law to annihilate your people. Help us be faithful now that we might be faithful then. Bless these who have come forward today. Surround them with your angels. Give them the Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll help them to have joy and gladness as they accept the good news of Jesus' mercy that will take hold of that scepter of grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you, friends. And those who have come forward, we have pastors in the lobby. We'd be happy to pray with you again or counsel with you. Uh, a couple of closing announcements. Some of you remember the announcement Amazing Facts is producing another very important documentary called Armageddon, The Final Events of Prophecy. We are looking for some of you who want to be part-time actors and be part of that. Uh, Danny will be in the lobby. She can sign you up if you're willing to participate as part of the, what they call extras in this movie. We thank you. And we receive our offerings and tithe at the door. God bless you and happy Sabbath. Hi friends, the program you just watched was recorded at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where I serve as lead pastor. We'd love to meet you. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, come and worship the Lord with us. We'll meet you in the lobby and shake your hand. This presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. 
At four feet tall, the emperor penguin is the largest penguin species in the world. Every spring, these majestic birds travel up to 75 miles inland on the Arctic ice pack, walking and sliding on their bellies, to arrive at one of the most desolate and remote places on Earth. Once the female lays an egg, her male companion quickly rolls it onto his feet and covers it with a fold of his fat, feathery fur to keep it warm. While the females leave to feed in the ocean for about two months, the males huddle together in clusters for protection from the frigid wind, incubating the eggs on their feet while enduring the brutally cold, dark winter. Emperor penguins demonstrate some of the most patient devotion and warm love for their young of any creatures. And they do this in the coldest conditions on Earth, where temperatures can drop to 85 below zero. The Bible says in the last days, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But your love can stay warm even in a cold world. As a Christian, are you warming those around you with God's love? At the heart of all of this is the question, is your Christianity real? Join me now, friends, as we look at what the Bible has to say on this very important topic. I heard one time about um, this mission organization that was placing missionaries in different parts of the world, they had a unique way of testing the missionaries. The candidate was told to arrive at three in the morning for the exam, three in the morning. And so there's one candidate, he came at three in the morning, he went to the room where he was supposed to meet the examiner and he waited there until five in the morning, nobody there. So he waited a little longer until 8 in the morning. Finally, the examiner came in at 8 in the morning. He said, um, 